That's what inner engineering is about. Mm. If your context shifts from your psychological and physiological process to the life process that you are, everything has changed. Because we must understand this, as we sit here, this is my body, that's your body, this is my mind, that's your mind. But there's no such thing as this is my life and that's your life. Mm -hmm. it's, this is a living cosmos. Everybody is free to capture as much as they want. If you capture substantial amount of life, your very presence will become a significant life. Otherwise, you will become a mediocre life. This is the important thing. It's not the knowledge you gather in your head, it's not the muscle that you gather in your body, it's the life. How much of a life are you? This will make you significant in your very presence. If world gives us an opportunity, we'll do something impactful. Otherwise, we are just a significant presence. A huge oak tree standing outside, it is not trying to create any impact. It is just impactful. If you go under its shade, you'll feel it. Otherwise also it's impactful. Most people notice it only when it's gone. <laughs> when I was uh, twenty-five years of age, when suddenly things burst forth within me, and I realized if I sit here without messing myself, naturally I'm bursting with ecstasy and every cell in my body drips ecstasy. I thought initially I'm going off my rocker. Then again and again when I saw over a period of six to eight weeks, when I saw, if I just close my eyes, I just burst into ecstatic states. So I clearly realized, if I don't mess with my physiological and psychological process, ecstasy is the only way to be. Mm -hmm. Nothing to be done, you don't have to do anything. When I realized this, I sat down and actually planned. On that day, the world's population was 5.6 billion people. I made a plan in two and a half years' time, that I will make the world ecstatic. <laughs> no fool like a young fool, you know <laughs> Now, uh, it's been thirty-seven years, not two and a half years. Well, people say we have touched over five hundred million people or so. Don't say, whoa, you don't whoa my failures <laughs> Yeah, I guess. Because my idea of humanity is seven point six billion people. Five hundred million people, time going away, mm. I'm… I'm condemned to die a failure, but I'm a blissful failure, all right? So, what we need is just this. Do you want to live in a beautiful world means what? Beautiful does not mean just a beautiful view of the ocean or something else. Beautiful means human life here is pleasant within every human being. The question is not about what I wear, what I drive, where I live, but how I am within myself. See, what we can do in the world is a question of times, in which time of history we exist, accordingly we do things. Mm. If we were here hundred years ago, we wouldn't be recording all this stuff, all right? We would be doing something different. But Human experience is constant. Whichever generation you are, you can either be blissed out or misery. Always, forever, it, it has been so and it will be so. So, what we can do in the world is subject to many realities of the times. Passion put us over the edge. Passion set us apart. Passion made the difference. Can I tell you something? When you're passionate about something, it isn't reasonable, but you do it anyway. When you're passionate about something, it's not possible, but you do it anyway. When you're passionate about something, passion will take you where nothing else will ever take you. It'll give you that decided edge. It'll help you to stand out. Wow. Now, let me just say something about purpose and dreams and finding your purpose. I wrote a book a few years ago called Put Your Dream to the Test. And basically it's questions you need to ask yourself to make sure if your dream is a valid dream. And I would go around and I would teach off of this Put Your Dreams to the Test lesson and, and all of a sudden it hit me that there were a lot of people that didn't have their own dream. I, I had assumed when I wrote the book that everybody had a dream. I've had a dream. 
And, and all of a sudden I realized there were people coming to me and said, well, I, I don't have a dream for myself. And I could see that they were a little lost and all of a sudden it hit me. And this is what I want you to understand. You may not have your own big dream for you, but it is probably because God has someone for you that he wants you to join and help them fulfill their dream. You see, this is a biblical principle. Not everybody has their own purpose and own personal dream. Look at the, look at, hey, look at the fishermen down at the Sea of Galilee when Jesus walked into their life and said, Hey guys, follow me. I'm going to make you fishers of men. What did he do? When he walked into their life, he gave them a dream that they didn't have. He gave them a cause that they didn't have. He gave them a person to hang around with that they didn't have. And let me tell you something. Sometimes God has people literally designed to come along and complement each other so that the dream can be filled. Teamwork makes the dream work. I've seen it happen many, many times. I can tell you right now, for many of you, it's happened in this church. You found this church, you found this place, this place of grace, this oasis, this place of vision, this place that is making a difference, this dynamic place. And all of a sudden you started pouring your gifts in here, your, your spiritual gifts, your, your financial gifts. You just kind of, kind of lost yourself and just dove into this congregation. And now you're seeing amazing things happening. And it's an absolute fact that some of you, your place, your purpose, your dream is to come alongside, compliment, add value, and do something for someone that they cannot do for themselves. Every great person is great because people have come around and supported that dream and supported that vision. Look at Jonathan and David in the Old Testament. Jonathan rightfully was going to be the next king. His father Saul was the king. He was the rightful heir. But when he saw David, he said, no, 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 David is the anointed one. I'm going to back up. I'm not going to be the king of Israel. I'm going to support David. I'm going to let him be the king of Israel. I'm going to be a king maker. And, and Jonathan understood that whole poss possibility of putting his purpose into the purpose of someone else. Now, obviously, you believe. something is the case, it implies that you don't know. You have no evidence for it, but you believe it. So you wouldn't say, I believe in this table. I don't have to, because it's, I know it's here. What well, we call a table, who knows what it is on other levels. But you don't need to say, I believe in this flower. I know there's a flower here, or at least that's on this level of perception. There's, so belief implies you don't really know, but you would like something to be. Or, and that's interesting. In religions, those things are regarded as very important. Uh, you believe in certain things that have been transmitted to you to, from going from generation to generation that are in the books and then you have a certain belief structure and since you're not free of ego it becomes incorporated into your sense of identity the collective identity of we the believers in these particular kinds of stories uh, there is in the English language, there's the word belief, and there's also the word faith. And they're quite different, but sometimes people don't realize the difference. In some languages, there's no difference between these two words. In Spanish, you have fe, which is faith, and creencia, which is belief. But if I remember correctly, in German, you only have one word for faith or belief, and that would be Glaube or Glauben. <clears throat> but they're very different. Faith is... Thank you.
true meaning of faith is a deep sense of trust. And what you are trust, and you have that deep sense of trust because you are connected with the essence of who you are, which is one with the essence of the universe. I forgot to mention that before. You are connected with the essence of who you are, that's the vertical dimension. You realize yourself as consciousness. And that consciousness is not yours, although I sometimes call it your consciousness, it's not yours. Because if I said my consciousness, I would have created a duality. There would have been me, an entity who has consciousness.